Let your kingdom come here. Let your will be done in us. Jesus, there is no
What it will be like when I walk by your side I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me I can only imagine only imagine Surrounded by your glory What will my heart feel Will I dance for you, Jesus? Oh, no, you be still Will I stand in your presence? Or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? I'll be able to speak it all I can only imagine I can only imagine I can only imagine When that day comes And I find myself Standing in the sun I can only imagine when all I will do is forever, forever worship you, I can only imagine, I can only imagine, surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel, will I dance for you Jesus? Or in all of you be still Will I stand in your presence Or to my knees will I fall Will I sing hallelujah Will I be able to speak it all I can only imagine Yeah, I can only imagine Yeah. 
Good morning, welcome to worship. Worship is defined as the expression of reverence for God or devotion to God. And that is why we are here today to worship. This is the third week 
in our 11-week series, Unraveled, a series about people in the Bible whose lives were unexpectedly unraveled, as ours have been, and about their relationship with God during those difficult times. The strands of fabric that are behind me represent pieces of a beautiful tapestry or a beautiful life that have been unraveled, and yet they have the possibility of being rewoven into a different but beautiful tapestry as our lives do. We will receive communion later in the service. If you have not already done so, would you get whatever food and drink you prefer so that you are ready when we come to that point in the service? When we come to this space, we bring all of ourselves. We bring joy and hope, dreams and prayers, grief and doubt, memories and heartache. God meets us here. God hears our prayers and sees our scars. With open hearts and authenticity, let us worship good and gracious God. Trusting in the mercy of God, we join in the prayer of confession. God of creation, humanity is capable of such evil. Stories in scripture alongside stories on the news remind us of that truth all the time. For the moments when we choose violence over peace, exclusion over inclusion, and fear over hope, forgive us when we choose pride over what is right and comfort over justice, show us mercy. And when we numb our pain instead of leaning into empathy, unravel us, for we long to be changed. Gratefully we pray, amen. Beloved of God, hear the good news of the gospel, which is for you and for all people God takes the broken pieces of our lives and hymns us in before and behind. Whatever you have done, whatever you have failed to do, whoever you are, whoever you wish you were but are not, you are forgiven in the goodness of Christ's love. You are enough, you are set free. Let us live in joy. Thanks be to God.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. God of unending surprises, this life is a tapestry of moments woven together, and we long to be weavers of love. In this season, we gather and we pray that you would unravel our bias, unravel our assumptions, unravel our worry, unravel our fear, unravel whatever it is that keeps us from you. And as you do, clear space in our hearts for your word. We are listening. We are praying. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. O oh, holy God, holy and merciful, holy and mighty, you are the river of life. You are the everlasting wellspring. You are the fire of rebirth. Glory to you for oceans and lakes, for rivers and streams. Honor to you for cloud and rain, for dew and for snow. Your waters are below us, around us, above us. Our life is born in you. You are the fountain of resurrection. At this font, holy God, we pray. Praise to you for the water of baptism and for your word that saves us in this water. Breathe your spirit into all who are gathered and into all creation. Illumine our days, enliven our bones, dry our tears, wash away the sin within us, and drown the evil around us. Satisfy all our thirst with your living water, Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Brady, child of God, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And together we say, you belong to Christ, in whom you have been baptized. Alleluia. And now, Brady, child of God, you've been sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. Amen. And finally, we have one last gift for you. This is a candle that we light off of what we call the, the Paschal candle, or, or really just the Jesus candle. It represents the light of Jesus in our world and in our community and in our church. And so, Brady, let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Amen. I'm going to hand that to you. And together, let us welcome the newly baptized. We welcome you into the body of Christ and into the mission we share. Join us in giving thanks and praise to God and bearing God's creative and redeeming word to all the world. And on behalf of all of the members of Grace Lutheran Church, we welcome you and we welcome Brady, our newest baptized member, our newest child of God. A reading from Samuel. Now Saul had a concubine whose name was Rizpah, daughter of Aya. And Ishbal, Saul's son, said to Abner, commander of Saul's army, why have you gone into my father's concubine? Now there was a famine in the days of David for three years, year after year. And David inquired of the Lord. The Lord said, there is blood guilt on Saul and on his house because he put the Gibeonites to death. So the king called the Gibeonites and spoke to them. 
Now the Gibeonites were not of the people of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. Although the people of Israel had sworn to spare them, Saul had tried to wipe them out in his zeal for the people of Israel and Judah. David said to the Gibeonites, what shall I do for you? How shall I make expiation that you may bless the heritage of the Lord? The Gibeonites said to him, it is not a matter of silver or gold between us and Saul or his house. Neither is it for us to put anyone to death in Israel. He said, what do you say that I should do for you? They said to the king, the man who consumed us and planned to destroy us so that we should have no place in all the territory of Israel. Let seven of his sons be handed over to us and we will impale them before the Lord at Gibeon on the mountain of the Lord. The king said, I will hand them over. But the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Saul's son, Jonathan, because of the oath of the Lord that was between them, between J David and Jonathan, son of Saul. The king took the two sons of Rizpah, daughter of Aya, whom she bore to Saul, Armoni and Mephibosheth, and the five sons of Merab, daughter of Saul, whom she bore to Adriel, son of Barzillai, the Maholathite. He gave them into the hands of the Gibeonites, and they impaled them on the mountain before the Lord. The seven of them perished together. They were put to death in the first days of harvest, at the beginning of barley harvest. Then Rizpah, the daughter of Ayah, took sackcloth and spread it on a rock for herself. From the beginning of harvest until rain fell on them from the heavens, she did not allow the birds of the air to come on the bodies by day, or the wild animals by night. When David was told what Rizpah, daughter of Aya, the concubine of Saul, had done, David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of his son Jonathan from the people of Jabeth Gilead, who had stolen them from the public square of Beth Shan, where the Philistines had hung them up on the day the Philistines killed Saul on Gilboa. He brought up from there the bones of Saul and the bones of his son, Jonathan, and they gathered the bones of those who had been impaled. They buried the bones of Saul and of his son, Jonathan, in the land of Benjamin in Zela, in the tomb of his father, Kish. They did all that the king commanded. After that, God heeded supplications for the land. The word of the Lord. You know, when I was younger, uh, probably around elementary school aged, my family with the church that we were attending at the time, we had a, a big carnival, a kind of a fall carnival out at the church. And all different families kind of came together and put out little kind of carnival games and, and prizes and all sorts of kind of fun things for families to do in the fall. And we had all sorts of things. There was a, a game where you played like kind of musical chairs and whoever won the round of musical chairs got to take home like a pie or a cake or something that some family had made. We had uh, one of those dunk tanks where you threw the, the balls and whoever was up there had to kind of fall into the, the big pool of water. We had even uh, one of the kind of big jars full of jelly beans and, and a big sign that says, you know, write down your guess how many pieces of candy are in this jar closest guess wins. And I was pretty fascinated by this giant jar of candy. I looked at it for a long time and tried as hard as I could to kind of guess how many pieces of candy could possibly fit into that giant jar. Because, you know, of course, whoever wins gets to take home the whole jar for themselves. And so I, I filled out my guess and I uh, waited for the end of the carnival to see who would be announced as the winner. And much to my surprise, when the time came to, to poll and figure out who got closest to who the winner was, uh, it was my younger sister who guessed exactly the number of jelly beans that were in that jar. I think it was somewhere around 347 or so. And so she got to take home this entire jar full of candy. And uh, believe it or not, she didn't share one piece of that with anybody. She kept it for like a year and ate it all herself, and it, it was a whole thing. But I remember on the way home asking her, how on earth did you figure out how many jelly beans were in that jar? How did you do it? 
and my sister have just said, you know, we were at that carnival for a very long time. And so I stood next to that jar and I counted every single jelly bean I could possibly see in there and looked at every single one. And that's the number I came up with. I was kind of astonished by that because I tried every way I could to figure out how would I know how many were there, and I was completely off. I guessed a thousand and some, and there were about 300 in there. Now, with every kind of carnival game, no matter what it is, there's always kind of some little, little trick to how it works or some trick in the human psyche that gives whoever the person running the carnival game is, that gives them the edge. And after, you know, enough time, you can, you can look it up. The reason that these games work so well, especially the guess, the number thing, it has to do with um, part of how the human brain works, how the human brain um, is kind of designed to understand numbers. And it turns out our brains are really good at understanding and seeing numbers when they're, when they're small enough, when they're, you know, within, you know, one to like nine. When things are small like that, we can see a, an image of something. And if there's, you know, five to seven or maybe a few less, we can know right away exactly how many are there. We can just see it. As the numbers get a little larger, we have to kind of estimate. And we make guesses on how many there are. And we can do pretty well up until between 20 and 30 or so. Once there's more than 20 or 30 of something in an image or that we have to kind of wrap our heads around about how many that would be, when we get above those numbers, the guesses that we tend to make, all of a sudden, instead of being pretty good, can be way off. Once you're into the range of hundreds of something, our brains just stop comprehending how many are there. And so you can look at a jar like this and maybe make a reasonable guess of there's like 150, 200 or something, and some other people might think there are 2,000 of something in that same thing. This is a tenfold difference. It turns out our brains struggle to wrap our minds around numbers after they grow to a certain size. And I think that's sometimes to our detriment as a society, especially when we look at statistics of, of deaths or of tragedies. Because while we can understand and we can kind of put ourselves in, in the minds and in the place of uh, a family when one or two or a, a few people have suffered a horrible tragedy, when it's numbers like 10 or 100 or 200,000, our minds start to, to lose track and we don't fully grasp what is happening around us. You know, I think something simpler or, or similar is happening in this story that we have assigned for the day. Rizpa, this uh, woman, is in a society that has been plagued by violence. Again and again, there have been attacks and wars and battles and skirmishes, and there has just been so much violence that the whole country seems to be numb to it that when, you know, thousands or tens of thousands are attacked or killed, it seems almost like a footnote in history. And so when the day comes when they're trying to kind of create an uneasy peace between a few factions and the king sees a way that it can be done just by, you know, having seven people killed, it seems like a pretty good deal. It seems like a much preferable option than all-out war or another bloody battle where hundreds or even thousands may die. And so while the king jumps on this chance to take a few of the maybe less important sons and hand them over to the enemy, Ritzpa refuses to see the logic. She refuses to be reasoned with. She refuses to see that this idea that this plan might be for the greater good. All she can see are these seven boys, her boys, being taken away and slaughtered and killed, and she is heartbroken, and she can't hold it together. She can't hold it together, and she goes off, and she spends days mourning 
in sackcloth and ashes, chasing away wild animals from their bodies. She is inconsolable. She is unraveled. She has lost it. And yet, it's those actions and those moments, that, that connection that she had to the humanity of these boys that kindles something in the king. Her losing it, her becoming completely unraveled and disheveled and not knowing what to do in the midst of her grief, it makes a connection with those around her. All of a sudden, this story isn't about seven dying so that who knows how many hundreds of others might live. It's about these seven beautiful people who are beloved by God, who are sacred, that have been lost and need to be mourned. Ritzpah, who in her own right had virtually no power in the country and over what was happening, and the act of holding on to humanity and, and losing control and losing all sense of reason and all sense of her decency and all sense of having things put together by losing all of that by letting her heart be so touched and so torn and broken by this situation she changed the world she changed the mind of a king and she changed the mind of god who says no longer will this land require this kind of death and supplication there's great power in losing control. There's great power in having a heart that refuses to let go, that refuses to see just another statistic and will only hold on to those beautiful single individuals, to that heart who will count each and every piece of candy in an entire jar. I think we're in a moment today, where we need a few more ritzpahs in our lives. We are in a moment and in a world that feels like it's gone numb, that it's gone numb to violence and sickness and death and police brutality and so many things. If you're anything like me, you might flip on the news once in a while and just have to turn it off because it's too much to take in because it's too much to try and hold in our minds or in our hearts, because there's just too much. We're in the midst of a pandemic that has already killed 200,000 people in our country. We're in the midst of what feels like a very pivotal moment in black and brown lives mattering in this country and in reforming of how police work in this world specifically when it comes to caring and saying that those black and brown lives matter. We're in a moment in this world where no matter where you turn, it seems like these horrible things are happening. You can see in, in China, millions of people are in concentration camps because of their religion, and it's barely a footnote in our history right now. There's so much that is unraveled and broken in our world, and it feels so scary to even hope in our hearts a tiny bit. But that's exactly what God is calling us to do. To look out at this world as broken as it is because it is as broken as it is. And to let our hearts see not just a bunch of numbers, but each individual story, each individual person whose lives have been thrown into turmoil and whose lives have been lost. We are called to care for the people of this world, to see the world the way God does, as billions of sacred bodies, as billions of sacred stories each one deserving of our love and our care. And that's exhausting. It's a scary thing to try and do. 
It can feel like if we open our heart just a tiny bit to the world around us that we are going to be drowned in emotion, in sorrow, in despair, or in anger. But the story of Ritzba shows us that God doesn't just work through people who have things all together. That God doesn't work through people who can rationally think their way from point A to B to C and come up with a cohesive plan. Sometimes God works through people who have lost it. Sometimes God works through people who are angry or inconsolable. God works through people who are completely unraveled. Because I think it's in those moments when we can't hold it together, when we can't hold in our hearts the pain that is out there in the world, when we feel like we are drowning, it's in those moments that the Holy Spirit shows up. And she whispers into our hearts and she picks us up and gives us a new way of being in this world. People who are completely unraveled, who have lost control. When we hear that call of the Holy Spirit, things around us start to change. People take notice and something new happens in this world. If you've paid attention to the the Black Lives Matter movement, something that you might have noticed over the last number of years is that the conversation isn't about the, the numbers or the statistics or how many people are in jail or what percentage of stops that police make are of black and brown people versus white people. Instead, what we hear are stories, stories of individuals, people like Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and Trayvon Martin and these stories, one by one, again and again, they hit us and affect us in a different way because they force us to open our hearts. These stories start to change the world. And it starts with the people of God looking out at the world and not just seeing a sea of numbers or a bunch of statistics, but seeing each and every one and counting, and knowing, and loving, and caring about each and every one of these stories. This isn't easy. It can be exhausting, and terrifying, and overwhelming, and rage-inducing all at once. But this is how God calls us to live into this world. This is how God is calling us to change the world, right here and right now. Amen.
the point in our worship where if we were gathered together in person we'd be passing our offering plates. Of course we can't do that online so instead we're using this time to share with you a little bit about what we're doing together as the church. A little reflection, a little time to show how ministry is continuing and even flourishing at this time. Today we have a little bit about our Camp Grace Place, our outdoor family worship that happens at 9.30 every Sunday morning right out here on our Catherine Lawn. Before I turn it over to the Mercado family to tell you what Camp Grace Place has been like for them, I want to say thank you. Thank you to so many of you who have been able to continue your gifts and your offering and your support to Grace Lutheran Church at this time. None of the ministry that happens here can continue without those offerings, and so we simply say thank you. And thank you especially to those of you who have been able to give your time by volunteering here at the church and with our ministries that go on, and those of you who have been able to volunteer and care for your neighbors and those around you. This is what we're called to do, and this is how we're called to be the church today. Thank you. And now I'll turn it over to the Mercados to tell you about Camp Grace Place. So we, as the Mercado family, absolutely love Grace Place Kids Camp. The kids have been really enjoying it, and it's a perfect opportunity for us to worship together and be outside and share the word. And I have to tell you, it's been so altering to be able to go and refreshing that we get a new mindset for the week. And the kids have really enjoyed it because Esteban loves... The game. And Estella loves... I love when you explain all of the friendship words and what they all mean. And Enrique loves... Miss Rebecca. Miss Rebecca, of course, brings it to life. We are eternally grateful that we're having this opportunity to be able to share the word of God together. And thank you for allowing us to do it. And of course, the kids absolutely love the... Grace Place! Woven together as your beloved people, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Oh God, it feels as though the world has been unraveling since the beginning of time. We remember our ancient biblical sister, Ritzva, and her cries of anguish for her murdered sons, cries that eventually changed the world as she knew it. 
The news these days is too big, too heavy, too much to take in, and too much to act on. It's easy to become numb, and so today we beg you to fill us with the spirit of Rispa. Keep our hearts open and soft and tender so that they too might break along with yours and spill compassion out on this grieving world and all who suffer in it. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Oh God, it feels as though the world has been unraveling since the beginning of time and your church is no exception. We struggle in these days of pandemic to figure out how to follow you most faithfully. Our longing to be together makes us impatient at our inability to fill our sanctuary with our many voices joined together in song. Our differences in theology and practice cloud our ability to witness effectively to a world that is desperately in need of your grace. Knit us back together into one body for your sake, Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Oh God, it feels as though your world has been unraveling since the beginning of time, and we grieve with you the unraveling of your good creation. Quell the fires that burn in the west and the winds that rage in the east. Calm the extremes of climate change and move us to action toward lasting environmental peace that all creation will find healing where it is damaged. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Oh God, it feels as though the world has been unraveling since the beginning of time. As the fabric of our country appears to be coming undone, we pray that you would give us new hearts and new spirits. Where sin permeates the structure betray your values, teach us to trust your authority and to set aside our destructive and arrogant ways. Move us to action so that all of your children might know the abundant life that you desire for each of us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Oh God, it feels as though the world has been unraveling since the beginning of time. Weave wholeness into the lives of any who suffer illness of body, mind or spirit we pray especially today for carol marge riley lloyd helen beth bill alice and all those who are on our prayer list and those who are in our hearts lord in your mercy hear our prayer Oh God, it feels as though the world has been unraveling since the beginning of time, but we know that you hold us fast in the spiraling. Fill us with your compassion and strength. Ease our anxieties and wrap us in your love as you have done from the moment that you called creation into being. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, we entrust to your care through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Dear friends, this pandemic has unraveled the ways that we are accustomed to gathering with one another. But we know that there is not a quarantine on God's grace. And so we gather around this table, which is God's table, which extends to the tables around which you are gathered in your homes or wherever it is that you happen to be joining us for worship. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, you have brought us this far along the way. In times of bitterness, you did not abandon us, but guided us into the path of love and light. In every age, you sent your prophets to make known your loving will for all humanity. The cry of the poor has become your own cry. Our hunger and thirst for justice is your own desire. In the fullness of time, you sent your chosen servant to preach good news to the afflicted, to break bread with the outcast and despised, and to ransom those in bondage to prejudice and sin. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. 
Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death and resurrection, we await the day when Jesus shall return to free all the earth from the bonds of slavery and death. Come, Lord Jesus. Send your Holy Spirit to fill the hearts of all who share this bread and cup with courage and wisdom to pursue love and justice in all the world. Come, Spirit of freedom. Join our prayers and praise with your prophets and martyrs of every age that rejoicing in the hope of the resurrection, we might live in the freedom and hope of your Son, through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Communion is a gift that we receive, and so we do not serve it to ourselves. If you are with other people right now, I invite you to serve one another using these words. This is the body of Christ given for you, and this is the blood of Christ shed for you. If you happen to be alone right now, hear these words proclaiming God's grace to you now. This is the body of Christ given for you, and this is the blood of Christ shed for you. Let us receive the body and blood of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.